All right. Okay, for the 13th and uh, final lecture on the cyclic symmetry system, we're going to consider uh, a lot of the physics that goes with this, but in particular I want to show how to uh, use a cyclic system to do a linear one. That is, uh, imagine taking a cyclic system and what we'll kind of do is cut it in half and then what you have left is a, is a, is a linear system of uh, 2n plus 2 approximation uh, to a linear n chain. So th that's a, 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 a kind of a neat trick uh, to uh, change the topology of, the, of these one-dimensional crystals when you speak of the modern uh, stuff that finally people are, real, are, are worrying about, and that's the topology of a crystal. Uh, what's going on outside to make the boundary conditions uh, either uh, good for some process or bad for it. So we'll get to look at a little bit of that. And uh, we're going to use another program called Bandit, which is only in old-fashioned form still. We're hoping to get that running uh, in a reasonable amount of time. It's, it's a real bear. Okay. Anyway, we're going to uh, talk other uh, other ways of breaking symmetry. We're going to talk about how when you do a, a, um, a symmetry reduction by making every other um, site uh, different, uh, you get, uh, in this case, a symmetry that's half as big. And then you get acoustical and optical modes. Those are things that are worth knowing about. But it's another example of type A, B avoided crossing going to get band gaps that vary uh, uh, in a funny kind of way. And finally, uh, if we have time, and I think we will, uh, the symmetry groups that are not just cyclic. We're going to begin the real group theory uh, in the next lecture, but uh, we'll get started with that, uh, with these two uh, examples, D2, and uh, we'll consider a little bit of uh, the differences between C3 cross C2 and C6, if that uh, will turn out to be uh, interesting from a group theoretical point of view. So let's get started. We have a little bit of review here to do because when we were talking about the uh, revivals, uh, we um, never got around to coming back uh, to the um, infinite square well. That it had those very strange uh, revivals that were upside down, whereas the bore was much m better behaved. So we have to have a little model here to see how you analyze that. And um, that will apply to things that we're talking about here, but we won't get into their revivals today. We just have enough time to discuss their basic uh, dynamics. So that's one thing I want to do. And then, uh, this business of breaking a rotor <coughs> uh, system or rotor or uh, or rotor with little square wells in it, little model of a crystal. Okay, um, the review. Remember that we uh, made a big deal about the difference between a uh, rotor that is something that was wrapped around and something that had an infinite set of walls on uh, basically a prison uh, uh, around it. So being able to circulate and have current is very different uh, from some system like this where all it can do is bounce back and forth uh, against the walls. So uh, what I'd like to do is use what we learned about the uh, Bohr rotor paths that is um, the zeros make up the pattern here. The white part here is uh, zeros resulting from an explosion of a narrow Gaussian packet that expanded until it started to interfere with itself and make these uh, patterns uh, as it wraps around itself uh, many times. And then uh, at one point uh, forms a uh, uh, package just like the one that came here at pi. This one is at angle zero. Then up right here at half time it formed a, a, 
a pulse an, an implosion instead of an explosion uh, at pi on the other side of the ring. So it started on this side of the ring, did all this stuff, and then collected itself, imploded on the other side of the ring, and then it will go back and finally at the top here return to revive perfectly after one whole uh, period. And these are all the fractions of that uh, where various other things happen. But this is, is a fairly, um, I think, if you've looked at it enough, uh, in terms of this geometry and the Ford and Ferry circles, uh, you can uh, dis you can discuss this a fractal very intelligently. And uh, the question is, how does this infinite square well uh, behave differently? So uh, let's look at that. What is this upside pul down pulse doing here? That's really the question. Um, how is the infinite square well uh, flipping the revivals? Uh, and unfortunately, I'm seeing now that the uh, pulse is very faint. Mm -hmm. So you start out with a pulse right there, uh, which is just a sketch of this one. This uh, is what it looked like at uh, time equals zero, and then time at any multi integer multiple of the fundamental period. <clears throat> so. The question is how uh, at uh, 1.5, or actually at 0.5 periods, do we get this film uh, upside down on the other side of the well? Well, this is just a, a matter of looking at the boundary conditions carefully. Uh, all of the infinite well uh, peaks here must be made of sine waves, whereas in the Bohr rotor, or um, <coughs> if I were to connect this back together again, I can make sine and cosine waves. I can have a, a, that extra symmetry. Here I don't have that. So the uh, answer to this uh, question is the Bohr rotor being made of sine wave components is anti-symmetric. That is, with respect to this point right here, it's a sine wave whose node is right here. And I can have any number of those, but in the, to make that particular wave in the Bohr rotor, I need to take a linear combination of a pulse here and then an anti-pulse right here. So every wave function that I make in the Bohr rotor that's going to mimic uh, this one has to put a node right here. And the only sure way of getting a node right there is whatever you've done out here it better come to zero here, so that means whatever you've done out here, you've got to have the negative of it right here. So the initial conditions for the Bohr rotor that will reproduce of the effects of the infinite square well, and that's really the topic of the first part of this lecture for uh, finite systems, uh, is done in this case by having a starting pulse right there and then another one that's just equal to it right there. So whatever it took to make that pulse it's going to have to be made out of odd functions. And then we're going to let it go. So we know what each one of these do does. Uh, it goes pi and reforms. And this one, which is upside down, goes also pi and reforms upside down. That's this, the flipped revival. That's how it happens. So. This thing is doing stuff behind the scenes, so to speak. This Bohr rotor here uh, is doing stuff over here, uh, which of course is not happening in the infinite square well, because all the wave has been confined to the prison, infinite wall prison. Okay? So that's the basic idea. Bohr rotor half-time revival is the same side up copy of the initial peak on the opposite side of the ring. So the upside down Bohr image will appear upside down on the other side. And of course, we could have had just one, either one of these. I could have this one and not have that one in this, in this system. And I would just get the thing to re re reform upside down over here. And remember, all this stuff is happening. Each of these two things are you know, behaving independently, like any linear combination of quantum states. They all do their thing 
independent of the others. Well, when they cross, you'll see some funny stuff. That's when they get to show uh, their little beats. But then they off to the races after that. Okay, so that's the, just a little bit of a lore of the dynamics of, uh, you know, peculiar dynamics uh, that is possible in symmetric systems. All these uh, different pieces of the space and time resonating uh, with each other, you might say. All the little phasers. Um, is there any the relation frequency. between this and negative mass? Well, negative mass is a whole nother story. Uh, I'll answer that question just very briefly, but it won't be terribly satisfying. However, we have talked about our little hyperbola for uh, the dispersion that we're supposed to use if we knew better. That is, if we knew relativity and didn't just confine ourselves to one-half mv squared for our energy, right? What we showed was this thing over here on the, the board that um, our dispersion relation for a vacuum, and it turns out the one that gives us all the mechanics of matter, is a hyperbola located with positive rest mass, actually mc squared, but let's take c equal to 1. So this is the mass uh, frequency right here. Uh, this comes with a partner down here where all the phasers go backwards. That is a possible solution. It's called a conjugate optical wave if you're doing optics, but uh, uh, in real vacuum, uh, that's very much part of the game. So, yes, negative mass, that is, uh, instead of having a curvature like that that's positive, a negative curvature uh, would be down here, a complete symmetry between these two. This is the time reflection symmetry of the vacuum, which uh, goes along with the parity, the, the uh, space reflection symmetry, and we're going to mention that group called the uh, CPT group at the very end of, of today's lecture. But um, as I said, this is probably not satisfying to you. In fact, I don't know all there is to know about all the things you can do with matter and antimatter. All we know that it comes together, throws light out, and disappears. Reverse of that is pair creation. We'd like to know more about that too. And with this kind of detail, I think we could learn more using the symmetry uh, fully. What we're doing here is just the beginning of that. Anything else? <laughs> okay, let's look at taking our old friend here, the block Hamiltonian for six things, a hexagonal um, exciton, that is electron in a crystal of six things. We'll look at some anima emanation, animations uh, of that sort of thing. Um, later on, perhaps today. Um, here we had a singlet, a doublet, a doublet, and a singlet, which were projections of the hexagon. That was the geometrical way to state our eigenvalues for the elementary block Hamiltonian. That is, the one that only had coupling between the nearest, um, call them potential wells, if it's a quantum mechanical system, or actual vibrating uh, masses if we're making a mechanical analog out of this. Of course, if we do that, that's a phonon band, which looks very different from this one. Starts out uh, with a linear dispersion and then bends over. We're going to just do this uh, particular case without worrying about that, because it's the electronic bands that we're trying to uh, introduce here. So the idea then is uh, to take those nearest neighbor components, put a minus sign on them so that the uh, state with no, no wrinkles, the zero wave state modulo 6, is the lowest state, uh, a singlet as it says there. Uh, the next thing comes a doublet of plus and minus waves uh, with one wave uh, in this uh, ring. And then two waves, a plus and minus, those two states there. And then finally three 
three this way and three that way because it's a totally real wave, it's a standing wave and there's um, no difference. So I don't draw another dot here, I only draw one there to indicate uh, where we are. 3 mod 6 is the same as minus 3 mod 6. So that's the, the system that we studied before with this uh, set of eigenvalues. Okay? Now what I'd like to point out... Sorry, I cannot remember these numbers. What do we mean by 3 6 or 2 6? Is it for rotating well, or...? What do I mean by... 2 6, I mean 2... Oh, well, these. The yeah, yeah. modular notation. Oh, okay. Those were the... Remember we had two uh, sets of integers that characterized this problem. There were first the p's, the points, or powers that were the exponents of the group operators that labeled uh, the states right here. P equals zero, P equal one, two, three, four, five. But mod six, this would be minus one. Mod six, this would be minus two, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the actual positions, okay? And now we're building, using the uh, group uh, spectral decomposition, uh, we're building here a, a set of numbers that you're asking about. Uh, this is m equals zero mod six. M for um, mode number, or um, in atomic physics, uh, the, the most common use is m for magnetic quantum number of something that's uh, capable of momentum. So m for momentum modulo six. I can have uh, and momentum is number of waves, so this is zero waves. This would be a state where all of these things had equal amplitudes and were going at once, say breathing like that. Uh, could be a, a, a typical uh, mechanical system, but the, here we just have a waves that have all the same amplitude all the time at whatever this frequency is. Could be zero. If we want to set our origin here, that's uh, fair fair to do. And then comes the next one. You see we have one wave modulo 6. Okay, So that's what those numbers refer to as the quantum number of momentum, but we're in a six-fold system with perfect symmetry. Uh, those numbers are only really valid up to uh, 6, which is the same as 0. So um, as we'll, show, we'll show pictures where we keep going with a, a wave function in wells. But right now, I can't do that. I only have uh, these quantum dots, if you will, and the waves on them uh, have only one shape, and so I'm stuck. That's the only sets of states I have uh, for this, this particular very simple system. And we do make quantum dots, like something like this, and watch their resonance. That's possible now. The catch is you got to make them all the same. Hmm. Molecules are really good at that because all their nuclei are the same, right? Hmm. Benzene, perfect hexagonal symmetry. We try to do this in laboratory with little clumps of stuff. It's really hard. Hmm? Hmm. Okay, has that answered a little bit of the question yeah. here? So these quantum numbers are used as a superscript label. And then the actual coordinates are subscripts. That's the 0 through uh, 5 of the P number, point number, position number. Okay, those are the P's. All right? So we're going to generalize this a little bit. We're going to mess with this. Anything else you can think of to ask about it? Um, okay. Well, here is uh, something. It should be pointed out. These high symmetry problems are really tricky if you aren't using the group theory. Because every one of these things is in resonance with every other one. That's a really hard problem. Now, if these were all different masses, they would each have their own local mode where they would vibrate. And a little higher frequency, maybe this one would vibrate, and then a little more frequency, and maybe that one have a chance. And the rest of them would just uh, be more or less stationary, very small amplitudes, while one of them 
had its day in court, so to speak, because the frequency was right. Okay? So you see, when systems don't have symmetry, even if they're complicated, it's usually pretty easy to figure out the various modes that you have. A system like this, everybody plays at once. They are all in the game at once, all with the same frequency. That's what symmetry uh, means. And so that's why it's really nice to have a powerful way to handle symmetry. But here we're going to mess with this thing. We're going to shut down this spring. We're going to fix it so that basically it's not there or else we'll just ground it so that it's just stuck. Okay? That's equivalent to putting a zero here. Now if these were all different enough, that is different compared to uh, the, the value of the tunneling or coupling, uh, that wouldn't affect very much to turn that one off because it is, it, it, you see, it would only affect these two. And if they were quite different, forget it. It's way up in the corner. Okay? And the, the energies presumably were in order, they'd be very different. You see, it wouldn't make much difference if I put a zero there. But this is a high symmetry system. These eigen solutions are really sensitive to pushing any one of these down. So if I put zeros, uh, there. I'm in trouble. Okay? Temporarily. Alright? So, uh, the things that we had before are not going to be eigenvectors and these, these uh, nice eigenvalues are going to get changed. So that's the problem. What happens when I shut down uh, any one of these springs and make it into a system that's six particles in a line, you see. Okay, which is a, you know, a pretty easy system to make. Uh, it's a lot easier than putting them in a circle. I've got two of them in a the line there. That was easy to make. So it's that kind of pendulum system that would be analogous to this problem. Here's a solution. It's very similar to taking the uh, infinite square well. It has these locked walls, you see, making the analogy with something that's essentially twice as big. But the, these, these uh, are discrete uh, origins here, so it isn't quite just twice as big. It's twice as big plus two. You've got to have some idlers in the middle here. So basically, if I'm going to simulate six things in a line, I need 14 things. Two times six, plus 2. 12 plus 2 is 14. And that's what I've got here. I've got a C14 system, which I know how to solve. Uh, there are the eigenvalues. It's just that I'm going to have numbers now going up to 14 instead of up to, to 6 or up to 0 mod 6. 6 mod 6 is the same as 0 mod 6. Here is 14 is the magic number, symmetry number. Okay? So the idea is that if I use, if I restrict myself, as we did in the infinite square well, to only sine solutions, don't use any of the cosine waves, just use the sine waves, I can immediately have an eigen uh, wave for this system and for this system that has a zero. Uh, you see right here. So there's the six-fold system, and now there's nothing there. And that's going to be our eigenstate. Throw the rest of it away. Just look at this part right here. And we'll have a, 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 a different kind of eigenvalue for the 14 uh, than we had for 6. But it will be the right one for the problem that has uh, 6 in a line. Okay. That's, that's the trick. It's, it's a clever trick. I'm not sure who did. I think this was something that Mr. Hund thought of. Hund's rule in spectroscopy is well known, but he did a lot of other things. Okay, so there's the Hamiltonian. There's the solution. We just pull, extract it from the 14. Okay? Sneaky. We've got a sine wave solution, just like we had in the, in the uh, infinite square well, except it's discrete now.
and that's what it looks like. There's the 14, and we're only taking the sine solutions. Now you say, well, the cosines are, are there too, aren't they, with the same energies? Yes, they are. They're possible. But they won't be solutions to the one that we're after with, which is just that much. Well, I should say more like I slide over here and you actually can see the solution that I'm looking for right there. Hmm. Uh, of course, that one's trivial. But then there's that one and then there's a wave here. We're going to look at those uh, in detail. So here's the deal. We start with this. We cut it in half, pin those guys right there, that makes six uh, things that satisfy a, a matrix like that. Okay? That's the idea. And look what it does. It really changes. Breaks those degeneracies as much as they could practically be. And it slips this one down a little bit and that one up a little bit. Okay, that's cool. No more degeneracies. No more chance to have current. This is like the prisoner M stuck in the wall, back and forth in the, against the walls. No current, uh, oscillating current, but no steady current, right? No chirality. This thing has a lot chance for doing things like this and that. This one does not. So they're all singlets. Okay. No funny business with degeneracy here. And notice what they actually, uh, look, all the sine waves look like. And they have little things where they run into each other, which is kind of interesting. So let's, uh, let's take a look. I'm going to show you a simulation of this uh, system. Now this is a system that's really of interest uh, nowadays because we make these graphene or phosphorus or there are many elements that seem to be happy to uh, allow us to see single films and we take another film and we put it on top if we put it just right there uh, this this would be a solution for the motions of say uh, six layers and there'll be modes in this direction which are observable I mean, this is the kind of stuff that's just now possible to do uh, in the last few years or so. Uh, we've been able to do a, a lot of things uh, like that. So this old idea comes back uh, sort of to uh, help us. So here's the first uh, case right here. There's the next one. There's the next one after that. Now that's kind of close to what would be a Brayon zone for the six-fold uh, thing. So right away we start seeing that the uh, solutions that we have for uh, three kinks here is uh, very similar to one with minus three. And here's the one with four is very similar to two. And then there's that one that's very similar to this one. But you see it's got a zigzag that this one doesn't have. So it's got a lot of higher energy. Now let's look at a simulation uh, this is a thing that I can run for you uh, fairly easily, I, I hope. But um, it, 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 it involves this program, which I hope we, as I say, will have in a few months uh, on the web. Right now you can uh, send me $5 in a box top or something, and I'll send it to you <laughs> for a use on an old Mac, which is what we're, we're actually using right here. So let me go ahead. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, do a um, spectral analysis of the transmission that is possible through this thing. This is an entirely different way to look at quantum mechanics. I think it's the most honest way uh, that we have to look at the kind of quantum mechanics we do uh, in um, solid state physics, but also in molecular physics. Uh, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to click C spectrum here and I'm going to go down to this line which looks like it only is a single line but in fact um, if I can I actually have to go and grab something to blow it up I'm going to blow it up a little bit magnify it look at that okay 
One, two, three, four, five. It's kind of what we've got right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think there's maybe I'm missing one there. Let's see how many holes do I have here. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, sure. I started to sing. I had this thing set for six before. Well, let's play the game anyway uh, with five. Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and magnify this one as well. These are uh, resonances. This is a very, very uh, clear resonance here. And um, I'm going to stick a state in that, uh, right on that resonance there. And let's see if we can see it. I'm going to animate it. Let's see if it works here. Go. For some reason, it's it not doing it. The go button. Try the. Yeah, let, there we go. That, I, you're exactly right. That's, that's it. Okay. Um, now, that's something weird. Uh, I, I did goof this up by putting two pieces of energy in there. So, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the spectrum and get rid of those things. I can kill anything that I've done. I'm going to kill that one. And I looks like I did something uh, there as well. Let's see if I can start this again. I'm going to close the uh, boxes here and we'll just let's do this uh, one more time here. Okay, let me blow up the spectrum there as wide as I can. There it is. And I'll just go ahead and stick an energy uh, right on this one. and try to get it as close as I can to resonance. Let's see if that works. More or less. More or less. But uh, you see there's a lot of reflection. All the signals coming uh, from this side and there's nothing sending any messages, only uh, outgo on that side. That's the way the initial conditions. I'll explain that in a minute, uh, what, what, what's going on there. But um, Let's go back and see the spectrum and see if I can see it really clearly by blowing up this one right here. And I can see I'm a little off. So I'm going to grab the mover here and I'm going to see if I can move this thing onto that uh, peak there. It doesn't look like it would make much difference, but I think it does. I think it will. Let's see if it happens here. Oh, uh, not still not so uh, good. I'm wondering why getting all that noise in the input channel. Um, hmm. Weird. Um, let me um, let me uh, go ahead and uh, go to animate here. I should just go back to main and uh, yeah, pick. I think so. Pick a, There's something corrupting you. You can't see. Yeah, I'm going to start it over. Um, I'm also going to um, take a look here and see if I can up the number of, of uh, things to what we've got, which is six. We might as well fix that while we're at it. Uh -huh. And then I'm going to take this 1.5 down to about uh, 0.8 just to make it a little smaller. And I'll bring A down. See if that works. There we go. Let's try this. I'm going to look at the spectrum. Uh, he had five before. His default over here was set to five. And he wanted to model this six. Six well. There and there we go. That that has six wells. One, two, three. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Still only have five. Watch it for a bit. Let you click. Let's see if I can get. It's a plane wave coming this way. It's interfering with each of those. So. Which is. That's There we go. It's yeah. Okay, that's the spectrum. He's blowing the spectrum up. It's, it's uh, oriented vertically, so he's taking the bottom band and he's blowing it up. Yeah, that's a transmission yeah. spectrum 
looked at it zooming in with high step. magnification and then even higher magnification. Mm -hmm. And these things are so sensitive mm -hmm. that you have to do that. And let's see if um, like real spectroscopy. There we go. <laughs> Think That's about what it. I was looking for. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. Unfortunately, I picked. I suck at five, so I. I'm making an obscene gesture. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that, but uh, you can see that most of the energy coming in here is making it through this thing. So that's magical in itself, because that's a high barrier. If, if I, uh, you know, move it off of that, uh, any uh, hardly any amount at all, uh, I am going to. Uh, you know, just have a little bit in here and nothing anywhere else. It's all going to come back at me and make a, 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 um, a, a standing wave at the entrance. Okay, so this is analogous uh, to this one right here. This is what I was trying to get. Obviously, I uh, mixed up the five and the six. Now we have just five uh, wells, um, six um, uh, barriers. Okay, and so the next uh, one, let's look at the spectrum again. The next one, which I will uh, get by closing this one out, and uh, I will move the energy uh, initializer, I'll set my initializer up to the next one. Okay, and then I'll magnify uh, that to see how well I did. It's, it's taking more amplitude the most and I'm pretty close, but not right on. So I'll use the move energy state here to bring that in line. And so we have our next resonance in this band. And that should also be pretty good. Although you can see there's a lot of echoing there. So that wasn't uh, perfect, but actually it's quite terrible. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering why that is. Something weird going on here. Um, we should be getting a, a solution that's quite like this, but obviously I've got some huh. uh, different uh, stuff uh, going on there. It's in resonance, clearly, and very weird one. It's putting out stuff down at the other end. But um, let me uh, go ahead and look at the spectrum again. That, that's weird. It's uh, one of those situations where you let something go for a while, and uh, it doesn't work as you know, quite the way it used to. Um, let's see if I can um, I'm go ahead and kill a few of these things. Here. Let's uh, see what happens here. Uh, there's still stuff in there. Um, oh, so he's, it's, yeah. He's giving me in there and adding. I'm going to go ahead and redraw. A mode. So it has a greater amplitude with respect to the others when he's going in there and changing it. Yeah, he's let's see. It down, he's basically saying, I don't want any, any of that mode at okay. all. Okay. Let's go see the spectrum. Play function. Let's blow up this one right here. See if it shows. I cannot figure out why this thing has an error in not giving us that peak right there. That's that's very asymmetric. I don't understand that at all, actually. That is bizarre. Uh -huh. um, let me try um, looking at this just to see what the next band looks like. And that's a, a lot better, although still uh, asymmetric. There's some, sure. something has happened in the dimensions. And it doesn't take much to, to spoil us. These things are really sensitive. Uh, so um, this is, uh, I'll go ahead and just start the first one of those just to see what it roughly looks like. Perhaps. And see if perhaps launch the app on the other projector, the other computer. I could do that, but um, this one is working well enough. The next band, which is different from this, above this uh, 
uh, band now has uh, um, two peaks in each. Uh, uh, well, see the node that's appeared uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, well now? We had an anti-node there before. So this is an odd band. This one will put anti-symmetric, locally anti-symmetric waves in every well. And it's doing it pretty well with, a, with an envelope that is just like this one. So as we go up in, the, in energy and start putting more and more nodes inside each uh, well, uh, getting another band, the next one is anti-symmetric, then it's symmetric again with two nodes in each, and so forth. By that time, we're over the barrier, but if the barriers were really high, we could probably do that too. But our nodes are at the well. They are not at, they hmm. are not at the barriers. Uh, say that again. Um, the in, node occurs in, within nodes. the well and not in the barrier. So it's right. You can Let's, get an idea about the energy because of that. Let let me uh, crank up the um, thing to make the barriers a little stronger. Um, I've got um, V A potential uh, of um, 1.5. Let me bring that up. There are other solutions than the one that's we had in your mind. Let's go ahead and <coughs> see the spectrum for this one. See if we if I brought that thing up a little bit there. Still weird. Still weird. Um, let me try one last thing here, and that is to give this thing seven p e times. Uh -huh. And um, that way, uh, I really will have the problem that's here. I think sure. that's probably cool. the problem. Let's just take, have a look at this. I've never seen that. With a uh, little higher barriers, I want to make the um, potential uh, a little higher here. That one right there. I see it from here. Let's see if I can get that up. 17, 18, 19, 20. Go ahead and give it a few more. 25? Yeah, let's go for broke here. Right. Uh, let's see the spectrum. It didn't crank it up. It just gave me the same thing. Oh, okay, we'll launch and then go back. Let's let's try uh, seeing what we get in the spectrum. Ah, that's looking good. Uh huh. That's more like this. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero in on this part right here, which is just going to be one sort of Lorentzian line, and then I'm going to go here and uh, put an energy uh, initial condition for that particular resonance. That's very good right there. Unless, although it's a little off-center, but that's mm -hmm. basically uh, this type motion right here. And I'm not sure why the off center, except that I may have been a little bit off on that uh, particular um, thing. I'm going to look at it again. You can magnify these things again and again. You can see I'm off, so maybe that's what it is. It doesn't take much. These things are really ticklish. Hmm. Um, we're talking about exponentials that are, that's better, so although it's still a little off-center. In any case, you can see uh, what it is that we're trying to solve, and you can see that this one works, this model works, you know, to within a few pixels until about here. This is a little high. And that's simply because it's feeling the it's it's feeling the fact that the barrier's in. It, when you get higher in energy, the the uh, tunneling changes because you have less of a barrier to go through. Now it isn't much higher, but as I say, these things are very very uh, peculiar, very uh, sensitive. So this one can sense better uh, his nearest neighbors than these 
uh, camp. So th th that's showing uh, there. But um, it's, it's an interesting problem. Okay. Can I tell you this problem? It's, it's a it's scattering problem where we have seven barrier. One yeah, is and the way they do that, they take some germanium, something or other, and then they have a dope germanium, and they layer down, you know, so many atomic layers, and they can mm -hmm. count those off. And then you do it again, and again, and again, and you make these things. This is, this is the kind of physics you use to make mm -hmm. uh, um, this device right here. This is a, a bunch of, uh, I had forgotten the name for it, uh, multi-beam epitaxial growth um, layers, I guess, is it? <laughs> That's, I can get it. <laughs> layers pretty well sums it up. You don't need all the other words. But um, that's uh, the kind of stuff that uh, either for light, this could be light, with mm -hmm. either, or electrons. And electrons, the of course, are... probability of having electrons at the third well is more than the others. Yeah, if you if you can get a, a, a current of electrons, mono, more or less mono energetic, are coming in, and they're the right frequency that is that close. You're talking four or five figures here. Um, it will excite the whole thing, and can you know most of the energy will go through. It'll transmit very close to 100 percent. Mess anything up, like all they'd have to do is bring a little extra potential few pixels right there or even down here and this thing would um, not send the energy it would all come back uh, in my face so it's a really sensitive resonator and then there's another way to do it where you get two a node I said there's only an anti node in every uh, well here uh, the next band is would have a node and then there's stuff that occurs above the barrier Yes. But it's um, very, not much of a variation. Mm -hmm. Not much of a variation. I'm wondering what will happen if we choose the bigger, the biggest. Oh, you really frequency. bring it up? No, no, the, the 3.82, the biggest one. Omega oh, 6. Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be one of these. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and see. <clears throat> I am going to... Uh, stop this thing to see the spectrum. Give me the spectrum back again here, thank you. Um, I'm going to grab it right here, I think I can do that. Um, move as opposed to create. I'm not going to create another uh, state. I'm going to drive this one all the way up to here. 3.82, okay, just get it in the neighborhood, all right, and then I'm going to blow that up, and I've got it programmed, I think, so that it will start me over again. There we are, and I'm not too far off, but let's move it right on as best we can. And while I'm at it, I'm going to blow it up one more time, just to see if... Oh my gosh, what have I got there? I've got two, it's telling me I have two states up there. I'm going to kill one of those. And I'm going to move the other one. Huh. Maybe I, I killed one that wasn't there. That's telling me that I had one and I, maybe I really didn't. Okay, I'm going to create one uh, right there. So now we're talking six figures to what it wants, and hopefully um, that will work. Let's see what happens. Bang. I see beating, so there's another state in there uh, that's been excited. And we're getting the resonance oh, between two. those. They are two? Th this on, is... On we're sending, we're sending not so just sure. monochromatic, we're sending bichromatic. There's another... Somehow the thing made another state for me, and you're seeing the beating uh, now between this and something probably like that. 
let's see if I can uh, start this thing over again. I don't know how those are all getting in there. That's bizarre. It's almost like this thing, like sitting around not being used for so long, it kind of rotted. Let's see if I can kill uh, any state that was down in the lower regions there. And then I'll just animate again. There you go. Mm -hmm. Now it's quiet. Now it's a stationary state, more or less. <laughs> uh -huh. And it's pretty good resonance, see? Only a little bit of beating here. <clears throat> Most of the energy going through. And you're talking about a wave that looks like that. Okay? Are we like the top. solving the Schrodinger equation and let me explain. Let me explain. The boundary condition yeah. to find the omega L 1 to omega 6. Let me explain what we're doing. This is, <clears throat> to me, the most honest way to solve Schrodinger's equation, but now very different from everything else that we've been doing, which is what you do is you have some potential. Ours are these jagged things, so those are the ones that work the best. Normal methods for solving. Uh, Schrodinger's equation have trouble with uh, infinite barriers. This is just designed to take care of infinite barriers. Okay, <clears throat> so I look at a, any curve and I break it up. Okay, and some number of pieces. Okay, and if it's one of these kind of things, well, I break it exactly the way it's drawn. <clears throat> Okay, so between each step potential, okay, you have a wave that looks just like that for any x from here to wherever it changes again. Okay, so you use those two and the idea is to play with these numbers. Okay, and you're interested in the wave function and its derivative, it's a second order differential equation. So you need both of these. We denote the derivatives of the D. Okay? So I take a derivative of this, I get this, take a derivative of that, I get that. Okay? <laughs> and then I write it as a matrix. Okay? Psi D psi. Okay? This guy coming from there, R and L. This guy here, from there. Okay? And I invert. Okay, I get the R and the L in terms of that. Okay. Now, that takes care of all the stuff that was happening here. Now, what we want to do is marry it uh, to one of the neighbors on this side. But let's suppose that that was the end of the road there. That's actually what our output channel is going to be looking like. Now, I've got to take care of all of the input stuff. If this thing were to just be flat from there on out, then I was going to do the rest of it on the, the stuff that left here. Okay, I do it again relations with respect to this k, the next one, okay? So it's the same uh, set of equations that we saw before for this region right here that we did for this one, and so forth. This is something you're going to uh, have the computer do, so it doesn't matter how many times it has to do that. You could have it do it a thousand times, you know, to take care of a curve that was um, discretized to one pixel for every um, thing, and that, that would work. So, uh, here's the deal. At every boundary, and we're just looking at one boundary here, x equal a, at every boundary, one side, x a, a plus epsilon, and then uh, look at the other side. <clears throat> I have a uh, something going on on the other side that looks like this, but these have to be equal. Mm -hmm. It's a second order differential equation the value of the function has to match, and so does the slope. The curvature does not have to match. The curvature is determined by the potential minus the energy. So that's part of Schrodinger's equation uh, right here <coughs> that is determining the second derivative. But the, f the zeroth derivative and the first derivative has to match. They both have to match. You can't do this, you have to do that. 
So that's what making this and this equal. Okay? So we're just simply going to plug that in from down here and do it again. Okay? So this thing down here comes uh, from this one. Okay? Just put them both together. So that gives you this thing in terms of whatever was here. So you can start over here with some value of R and L and ch -ch 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 through this whole potential from wherever it starts to wherever you want to finish it and then have it be zero uh, on the input and zero on the output or whatever you want, it doesn't matter. And you've got a set of matrices that have been multiplied for each jump. And now computers are really fast at doing that, so you can do this many times. So if you multiply the matrices, you have a single <coughs> matrix. And a special case that we're using uh, for this is no sources or reflectors on this side, the right-hand side. No incoming waves exist over there. That's what it's really saying. So a left moving wave coefficient is identically zero, but the outgoing is going to be whatever it is. We're, we're allowing that to be non-zero. <clears throat> and you see on the animation here, there isn't anything coming back. <clears throat> I'm setting my initial conditions right here, and I'm making sure that only stuff comes from the, le from the left hand side, only right moving uh, waves are there. You can see from the real and imaginary part that that's exactly what we've got uh, on that side. Okay? So, we just said R0 right here. Okay? And we get R prime, L prime equal to that and that. R prime and L prime equal to that and uh, that. Okay? So that's giving us the coefficients that we need to make that wave. This is just one barrier right here. That's what it looks like with this setup. So what you get is a lot of reflection. You can see a lot of stuff is coming back uh, at me when I send my uh, wave uh, to the right. That's called the reflection part, and there's the uh, part that gets through. That's the transmitted uh, part. So you get a reflection coefficient and a transmission coefficient. This is all stuff that's sort of elementary quantum mechanics when you're only doing one barrier, right? Okay? So, so that's cool. That, that lets it uh, uh, be, just to give you a feeling for that one, I think we, could, we have that one canned here. This is a one-hump transmission. I don't want that. I am um, going back here. That's not what I want. I want something even simpler than that. Single square step. Okay? That's what it looks like. Turn off the phasers so you can see the whole wave without being, um, you don't really need phasers when you have a simple uh, thing like this. A lot of reflection. Now the game is to see if you can uh, adjust this uh, thing uh, so that you don't get any reflection. <laughs> That's cool. And I think I have it. I call it Stairway to Heaven. Let's go back to the main here. And we'll turn on the Stairway to Heaven. See if that's working. If there's a, the devil is in this machine, then this won't work. But it, <laughs> we'll see if it works. Okay? There we go. Hmm? You can think of things with just a few ratios. Very easy to make. No reflection at all. All of this stuff is described <coughs> around Unit 4 on Chapter 13. And there's a lot of other interesting things that have to do with the wave mechanics and not symmetry there. But um, I thought you might be interested in seeing uh, that. Okay, we're going to take a whole different tack uh, right now, if you um, don't mind. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask about the, this other? We can 
either do it now. You don't or have do any it. reflection because of the kind of potential that we have chosen. I've just made just the, the right values and, and yes. thing here. Right. It's kind of like an exponential, but a discrete one uh, that does a perfect job. But it turns out, it turns. This is really surprising. It turns out that if I just draw a random potential with not too many steep jumps, just sort of draw something like that, it goes in. And that's just like what we were talking about before. When you make a boxcar spectrum, you're asking for all kinds of wiggling and craziness. But if you round it off, if you round it off, so that no particular Fourier component is distinguishable in, in its change from the, its neighbor. You mean that if, you, the you simplify. if the potential changes as smoothly, yes. we don't have any... That's right. That's called adiabatic uh, transferal or adiabatic, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's where you, you, you let the controls be turned on slowly in space and, and or time. Then the system will kind of follow you. It's called adiabatic following in the case of um, our two-level systems or three-level even systems. When the energy, when the initial energy is higher than the potential, the, I mean the, the potential. Y yes, if obviously, if I if I bring this down yeah. here right now without changing anything, I'll come back in my face. I have a little evanescent tail in there. It penetrates somewhat, but not much. Yeah. Okay, this is the different thing. Now I have a ring where every other coupling spring is different. We have A small, indicated by a line under the A, and A big, I, A high, kind of sign, uh, with a bar over it. Okay, and we have uh, here um, 24 masses. This is C, 24 uh, symmetry before I reduced it. Okay, so we have a matrix here, uh, and once again I see the blue is just not coming through on this projector. I have zero, zero for a power there, zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, and then one, zero, one, 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 two, and one, three, uh, if you can see that now. Um, that, yeah, well, anyway, um, these are the coupling coefficients, alternating A low and A high, but in, in, on the diagonal I just have A low plus A high, and then down at the other end, at the 23rd spot, I got the same thing uh, as I would have had. Uh, in uh, any of the other coupling things, except this one turns out to be a high. Okay, so that is the uh, Hamiltonian. And you see the idea is only C12 symmetry projectors are going to commute with this matrix now. The C24 symmetry is, how can you be <laughs> describing thing as broken, I mean, to really break it uh, in half, uh, so to speak. Okay, so we're going to have a projector made out of the subgroup C12 of what used to be the full symmetry C24. And it is only going to uh, be able to operate um, the, the elements that we have, the two kinds of M states that we're going to be coupling here, are the ones that have uh, even powers. You have to, the only operators that still commute with this matrix are even powers of the rotation uh, by uh, 2 pi over 12 that we had before. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, 2 pi over 24 that we had before is small rotation. Now we're talking about twice that, or twice the twice is 4, or 3 times the twice is 6, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> dot, 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 now I'm coming from the other side here, minus two, minus four, minus six. Uh, those are the, uh, the projector, that's the projector that I will be uh, using. So I put little dot dots because I run out of space for showing this thing. So first I'm going to apply 
uh, this projection operator uh, to the uh, zero uh, case. Um, let's see if that's all right. This is the zero case right here. I've got one in here. I remember you arguing about when I put the uh, group operator into a bra or a cat. It, it kind of is funny, but you got to get used to that. Uh, here, this is a unit, but if we had been doing coordinates, there would be a zero there, right? Remember that argument? You're very good to point that out. Uh, we're going to stick with this. Here it is written correctly with everything showing. Uh, so I'm going to be having this state here. That's K uh, sub M state. And this is a different K M state. I just put a prime on it to indicate it. But basically, it's even and odd. These are one, three, five, uh, all the way down to the last odd number that I need. This is zero, two, and four, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so these are the two states. Now that we have to set up a little matrix uh, involving those for all M, uh, and we'll have a solution to this problem. Okay, so we're looking for uh, and this would be an eigenvalue, but it's only going to be a diagonal element for M with itself. Okay, so there are the two projectors. Projectors are Hermitians, so the projector from uh, this thing is turned around operating on that. But it commutes with K, so it goes through and just gives me that. Okay, so all I have to do is sum that up. Okay from this matrix. And what do I get? I get just A low plus A high and nothing else. This is the off diagonal. This is where the uh, coupling that's going to mess up the old 24 eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, same deal. This becomes that. So then I go and I look and I notice a couple of these matrix elements, I get a number. I get one number from that one right there. So here's the off diagonal matrix element uh, for each value of M that we're allowed to have here. So there's the whole matrix. This would be a conjugate of, uh, of that, uh, <coughs> complex conjugate of that. And uh, that's what we have to solve. So let's look at uh, how that solution goes. I'm just doing secular equation. Trace of that matrix, determinant. Ideally, I just turn this into a U2 matrix and write everything out that way. But I'm doing it the more pedestrian way uh, here just to uh, show uh, what is uh, possible uh, just from uh, elementary algebra. So there are, there is our expression for omega squared, which will be the eigenvalues. This is a classical uh, oscillator uh, that we're looking at now. So this is a phonon band uh, that we're going to be making uh, for this thing, and that's what it looks like. So our spectrum, which started out with this nice, uh, what I call clock chain geometry, it's a 12 o'clock clock, okay, projected uh, onto there, uh, is going to split. This is an avoided crossing. We need to talk a little bit about that. But here I am showing you, just for the uh, purpose, the very lowest state is just like it uh, would have been if I hadn't have done any perturbation at all. Everything swinging together. And then, this is the Brouillon zone band boundary uh, for the first band, which is called the acoustical band. Here you see them doing a dance where every other one uh, is up and down. And then here's a, uh, one here where the same thing is true, but notice the difference. In this case, the every other ones are twisting a weak spring, a low. Up here, they're every other one, but this one is twisting the, a high, the very strong spring. So this one is a lot higher frequency than this weak thing where it's only twisting the, the, uh, the narrow line there that corresponds to the weaker spring. So there's the maximum gap. That's the one that's caused when these uh, diagonal parts 
the, when, when they're equal, these uh, two, two uh, things have the most effect. But when you're coupling five with seven, then the, uh, the matrix is uh, not quite uh, diagonal, so you have a less of a, an effect, and so forth, as you go further and further away from that center uh, case. Do you mean that in the optical band, the frequency is more than the acoustical band, but the wavelength seems the same? If we they can look define the same wavelengths. if you don't notice that the uh, dark line uh, mm -hmm. here is not being uh, bent, and the light one is. This is just the opposite. The dark band is being twisted. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the difference between having a yes. cosine wave here, and here it's more like a sine wave. Mm -hmm. you, you go up and have a lot of twists right there, and then you come back down. So the, the, this one is clearly lower energy, lower frequency mm -hmm. than this one. The now, thick band is different from the thin band. I mean, they are two different kind of band there. Yes, and this one, you see, the other thing that we could have done um, is we could have put alternating charges. And in this case, um, the idea would be that these uh, two, say it was plus and minus here, um, Th this one would create a, a no dipole moment, there would just be a, sort of a quadrupole moment. This one right here would produce dipoles. This one would not. So this one would interact with uh, laser light coming in uh, much more than this one would. And that's the reason for the name optical. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer here because I haven't done that. Now the other thing we can change is mass. We could have had alternating masses. Doesn't change the uh, basic structure of the levels, but it sure does change the physics of the modes. You, you shed more light on this, the avoided crossings you mentioned before. Yes, and I'm going to bring that up because this that's what's going on here. Lots of avoided crossings. Uh, some of them avoiding mo most of all, and then others not really uh, being deviated uh, much at all. We will see a hyperbolic. This is uh, kind of a hyperbolic uh, thing. Okay, now, um, before I go out, I want to point out that if we're doing with electrons, and we have potential wells like we've been uh, showing here, uh, then we have a situation uh, where we can make this very weak or make it a very tight oh, binding. Cool of electrons to the, to the wells. Um, and I'm going to show a little bit of an animation of this. Going back now to Bohr, this is the other animation program that is less honest in the sense that it's just dealing with states that don't have any connection to the outside world, but still uh, it's very, very useful. Now here you see a band, and we're going to be labeling these bands uh, by group theory uh, uh, very shortly. Right now is A1, E1, E2, B2. B2 stands for Gluon Band Boundary. There is a band right there with double degeneracies sandwiched by single. And we've seen that before. That's what you get uh, just with the uh, excitons that, that correspond to a six uh, wells. And so um, if I were to uh, e e e zero this guy out and start up this one right here, you'll see that's the scalar mode. They're all the same. And that's, that's the way I like to remember. A's uh, usually mean always the same. Now, A1 means always the same and with a scalar reflection symmetry in the wells. Then the E's mean sort of everything. 
uh, when you start in E, you can do it either with a moving wave, I'm going to zero it, so that I don't get uh, anything but a stationary state. I can start this thing uh, right there and get a moving wave, as you see, uh, coming toward me. That's the minus one. And then here's a plus one. I'm going to add the two. Uh, and I'm going to add them more or less the same, okay? Then I get a standing wave. And this is sort of a cosine standing wave with one wave, one whole wave, but it's all bent up by the potential, okay? The other state that's orthogonal to that, I'll try to make as well, I think it would probably do to just turn this to 90 degrees. There we've got a sine wave, right? <laughs> and I can slow this thing down or pause it. You see a kinky sine wave, right? Kinked by this huge potential. It's, it's doing an exponential behavior uh, or hyperbolic cosine behavior in the uh, barrier region, but out in the open here, it's doing the reverse of that, which is basically sine and cosine. So this is the uh, non-classical region, right? And you have exponential plus exponential minus. That gives you hyperbolic cosine, right? So there's the St. Louis arch right there, <laughs> right? Hyperbolic cosine. <laughs> sort of beautiful geometry of these waves. Okay. Now, if I adjust this uh, differently, I can move that thing uh, around. You see, uh, by just changing the phase a little bit here. Um, see if I if I slide it this way, and then let it run. I've moved it over a little bit. And then the next one is a moving wave with twice as many kinks, twice as many K coming at me. Okay? And I'll make a standing wave, say a standing sine wave, something like that, I think. There's two signs now, but they're very kinky. The kinks between the waves and the kinks overriding the uh, show. And then finally, here's a stationary singlet. And you can see if I uh, pause it, trying to pause it so that it doesn't get hidden. Um, you can see it's up and down. B stands for back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's perfect um, back and forth. All right. Now this back and forth has a node in the barrier. This back and forth has a node in the well. So let's go get that uh, one while we're at it. And it's a lot higher in energy because if it puts a node in the between region, okay, and an anti-node where the barrier is, it's going to have a huge energy difference. You can see it's way up here. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's what you're talking about when you talk about the difference between that and that. For, for this one, it's not much, but for this one, whoa, big gap, big gap, because the wave function of uh, uh, putting its uh, high um, amplitude on the bar on the barrier and having practically nothing near the center of the well doesn't get advantage of the negativity of the well. And then we go ahead and we start other. Uh, things there.
Okay, now um, I'm going to erase everything. I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to resume here. I'm going to start this one just for the fun of it, just to show you uh, what it looks like when I mix a top of the band thing with a bottom of the next band. A little dance, right? Mm -hmm. Squishing. That's brag reflection. And when I have a very narrow gap, this thing will go for a long time and then uh, uh, turn around and come back. You can, this thing looks like a brag dance, but if we make this much slower, Thing. I'm going to go ahead and stop it here, and I'm going to change uh, the barrier heights, uh, PE heat heights way down. Let's go down to uh, half of that, or less than that, just to see uh, what uh, that looks like. I hope this will work. Um, okay, I'm just going to assume that's the only thing I changed. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now there's not much of a gap, you see. Um, I'm doing a B1 there and a B2 there, okay? Let's look at the B2 first. Zero it, start the B2. So there it is, back and forth, okay? But mostly inside the barrier, right? Node in the, I mean, most inside the well. Node at the barrier, every barrier, right? Okay? The other one, I'll zero first. The other one puts the node in the well and the anti node on top of the barrier, basically. Okay? Now, when I mix both of these, there's that dance again. Okay? Now these waves are were both back and forth. Let's zero them out and look higher up, up to this band. Mm -hmm. Here's always the same, okay? And this one is always the same in the sense it is putting uh, that much in in the uh, barrier there. This thing's a little higher because it's putting the same thing off the side, but there isn't much of a gap. Up here, that's the only mm -hmm. gap. That's a really tiny gap, right? So the other one doesn't look too different. It's hard to see there's any difference in it. Um, but it's just moved over pi over two, basically. But let's go ahead and put both of them at once. <laughs> Do si do. Now turn around and brag reflect the other way. Hmm. Isn't that cool? Now you've got a moving way of going this way for a brief time. Now we're just doing standing. Now the current's coming back. So this thing is sending current this way and then, and then it comes back again. The energy is more than potential, I think. But why it's coming back? I mean, I'm not, am I getting the yes. point? The basic idea is that if I were to go even higher, I would have very weak brag scattering. I would send in a wave to this thing, and very oh. little would scatter back to me. That's brag scattering. Okay, and it's only in one dimension here. Uh, in a you know, two-dimensional crystal, the thing would go in and it would oh. brag scatter into different channels. Oh. This only has uh, two channels to go yes, forward and, uh, the and back. The material is bounded. I mean, yeah, it's bounded. It is. It is. It is exactly up there. Yeah. At the corner. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Doing its thing. There it is. Now it's circling with a left hand uh, polarization, so to speak, and then it starts to breathe. Ah, oh, boy! And then it starts working its way yeah. to right hand. Isn't that cool? Anyway, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, we're building things that are doing this. 
So all this stuff that was um, you know really hard to, to think about ever experimenting with uh, come forth. Now I'm going to skip. Um, I've got about uh, ten more minutes here. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of this, but I want to point out that this is parts of chapter 14 in uh, units uh, five and six. This is six already. This is a beautiful one that involves a double well potential. Okay, with Borat, it's a you know closed uh, system, just like this one here, um, and that's the trouble with this. This is a closed system. You see, I I don't have any way to send. You know, I'm, I haven't put in anything that goes in and interacts with this with the intera electromagnetic field, because that's the only way you're going to see it or see anything that's going on there. Uh, this is the same thing, same idea, except it's only two. So here's your um, symmetric state, and then you have uh, a big, uh, you know, uh, I should say, a, uh, a, a splitting here between that and this anti-symmetric state. Okay, and um, this is, uh, and I'm sorry to say this. I, did, I misspoke. That's the closest. This is an open system. This is banded. This is a, another example of banded using crossing matrices. So um, as you go up in this well, you'll get uh, the zero resonant doublet uh, there, and then you'll get a, another resonant double further up, and another resonance doublet you know, a little further than that, and then they become very diffuse as you go off to the top. Um, that is interesting to study, and we'll come back to these uh, later on. This is an example of the closed system, the ring that we just talked about, n equals 3, n equals 6, okay? And it has, as we're, uh, we're going to study these, we're going to study all of these uh, different group theoretical representations and labeling. Um, always the same one, back and forth one, and the E's in there, hexagonal uh, distribution, which begins to fall apart as this little curve, which we will calculate later on, becomes more curved. You can see it doesn't uh, fit a hexagon uh, quite right. But the way you get it is put a hexagon over that curve and then project, and you get the uh, energy levels very precisely. Uh, this is, has a name, I should have written it on here, it's a chronic penny uh, potential. Square wells that we've been working with, I haven't mentioned that name uh, yet, but we are doing some weird things with chronic penny. This is banded now, this is Borat, uh, closed system, this is an open system now. Um, that's a, uh, just this one, uh, versus this is 2n plus 2, and we have um, here just two wells, okay, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 2 is 6, so this is half of this one, you see. This is like the infinite square well part of a Bohr uh, rotor. But now it's an open system where I can take the spectrum for all frequencies in the in, in, in region of interest. And I see a doublet down here, another doublet right here, another doublet right here, you see, because there's only two um, valleys, uh, two um, little um, square wells uh, that are showing more and more tunneling as we go up. Start out pretty close down there and then they get further. This is all done Exactly. You take the chronic penny thing and you do a resonance uh, prediction uh, for uh, this fairly complicated system. So we'll be talking about that later on. Again, this is in chapter 14 of the uh, fifth unit. Now, avoided crossing, you had mentioned that that's something we need to review. I, it's so important that I want to go over it again just to get the idea. Remember, we had a pure bilaterally symmetric type Hamiltonian that described ammonia. That was the third system uh, that I brought up as a, as a great historically significant piece of physics. 
and the uh, idea of the NH3 uh, being up or down with its nitrogen, that's assuming the hydrogens didn't move, which is of course not right, it's more like this one has the hydrogens down and that one has the hydrogens up, whatever, uh, there's a tunneling amplitude for that that is given by a B-type Hamiltonian that we talked about before, bilaterally symmetric across the anti-diagonal. And there are two states, one is a plus and plus, another one is plus and minus in phase, but the amplitudes are equal for both of them. And this is due to CH, reflection symmetry, we're going to have to mention very quickly uh, some of the uh, naming to, to start today. Then here's the avoided crossing that results from putting an electric field on this thing that is uh, diagonally asymmetric. The A type uh, is a Hamiltonian we'd have if we didn't have any of the B, but with both of them this is a possibility for varying the relative amounts of the A type perturbation due to the electric field, this very high uh, field pointing down here see the little arrows indicating an electric field pointing down, and a little molecule that has, let's say, a positive charge on the on nitrogen, um, <clears throat> so that uh, the positive charge was very happy to move down with the field, and so we have a, a low energy here, but when it fights the field, uh, which is a pretty good sketch of what you're going to be when the hyperbola approaches these asymptotes, uh, you see the thing that we would call uh, the um, base states uh, of uh, this system and not so much the eigenstates that we get when the B-type Hamiltonian has uh, re-emerged with the electric field dipole moments dot the electric field zero. If that's zero, then it's back to this Hamiltonian. And there's the symmetric and anti-symmetric states in which the nitrogen's position is delocalized. That's a quantum molecule there. It is not uh, one that you can reproduce with Tinker Toys uh, very easily. And then you go the other way and it's uh, just the opposite. So there's the avoided crossing, resulted hyperbolic avoided crossing. And I would have you remember that the Hamiltonian that has both of these coefficients in it that would favor the A basis, would put the A on the diagonal and let the B be the perturbation, then you do a, trans a transformation which corresponds to a reflection at 45 degrees to A and B in Stokes space. That's this matrix right here, and it's inverse as itself. Remember that wonderful uh, thing? So when you do that multiplication, uh, out comes this thing, which is just this matrix with the A and the B switch, which is exactly what you did. You reflected A axis into B axis. So here it is being shown in the two-state uh, system. Okay, uh, again, these are things that you can look at uh, several times, and each time you look at it for a while, you see new things. So please take advantage of the uh, reviews. And here's the actual page 73 from uh, our lecture 10, in which I'm showing phasers instead of the uh, picture of the hydrogens like that. Okay, now, finally, some symmetry groups that are not just the cyclic N. The four group, very important, D2 and C2V. Uh, and uh, we'll do the spectral decomposition of it very quickly, but let's do some group theory. This is the real group theory where we look at how many groups there are. And the, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at the crystal point groups. I put all 32 of them here. But I've only drawn pictures uh, for the ones that are abelian. There's 16 of them that are abelian. Uh, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. But there's the, the uh, ones that are like what we call D2. And uh, D2 happens to be C2 cross C2. We need to learn uh, a little bit about that. That's some group theory. And then the D symmetry is that of a propeller, a flat bladed propeller. There, these are the uh, four positions that it could be in, and these are the operators that uh, uh, cause those positions to emerge from an original position, which you can choose more or less arbitrarily. So it's the same game, it's just that we're going to be doing more than just one axis. We have a rotation for all three axes here, you see. 
we half turn around the Z axis that the fan does, but then we can turn the blade over uh, around either the Y axis or the X axis. We can flip it on the X or overturn it on the Y. You can put this fan, take it off the ceiling, turn it over, put it back. It's the same. It will still blow air down on the hot customers. Okay, so it, it has that advantage. And uh, the operators are uh, written out now in uh, more, uh, uh, shall we say, a clear uh, notation there. And you can also put a little symbol on each of the different blades that sh so that they, it reads at this position exactly what the operator was that uh, uh, turned RZ, uh, took uh, the one and replaced it with RZ. So that makes sense. And then this RY on this thing puts an RY over there, and this RX puts an RX over there. So you just look there to see what operator <coughs> brought the propeller to that position. We're going to make use of that for complicated groups, like the cubic one that's sitting over in the corner there. This is most important, the CPT subgroup of the Lorentz group, charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal, same group. Okay, that's a key <laughs> symmetry that's been bugging a high energy physics for many years. Okay, spectral decomposition, real quick. Two C2 subgroup minimal equations. I pick X and a Y. I don't need to pick C because the product of those two would give Z, but we go ahead and get the projection operators for those two subgroups, get the completeness relation uh, just for the subgroups, 